A young woman stopped her car along a busy highway in California. She was never seen again. For three years, the search for her whereabouts continued, but the trail eventually turned cold. So cold that forensic scientists needed new techniques to solve it. Denise Huber lived with her parents in Newport Beach, California, an upscale suburb outside of Los Angeles. She just got graduated from college, and I think she just wanted to have, have fun and, uh, before she settled down into a job. Denise worked as a waitress and a part-time sales assistant at Bloomingdale's. At five foot nine, the striking blue-eyed brunette had no trouble attracting dates. Her most recent boyfriend was Steve Horrocks. He's a friendly, outgoing person, likes to have fun. I know she, that's what she would always say, Steve was so much fun. <laughs> On Sunday night, June 2nd, 1991, Steve and Denise planned to see the Morrissey Rock Band perform in Inglewood. But at the last minute, Steve couldn't get off from work. Disappointed but undeterred, Denise asked a casual friend, Robert Calvert, to go with her. She said, I'll be home late. And I remember saying, well, don't be too late, you know, because I always worry when you're not home on time. After the concert, Denise and Rob stopped at the El Paso Cantina for a drink, where Denise met an old acquaintance whom we'll call Ross. Ross had had a romantic feelings for her in the past. He did ask her to go with him that night. He wanted her to go home with him, which she did not do. Denise and Rob left the restaurant around one o'clock in the morning, and Denise dropped Rob off at his home. Rob was the last known person to see Denise Huber. Well, I think in the morning when she wasn't there, obviously, there was, there was some concern. But we didn't keep that close of tabs on her either. I mean, she was 23 years old and, and an adult and uh, totally trustworthy. Her abandoned car was found along the Costa Mesa Freeway, three miles from home, with a flat tire. It didn't look like anything had occurred at the vehicle. It was parked between two call boxes that were never used that night. In my mind, I just knew something horrible had happened. Because Denise wasn't the kind of person that would just disappear without telling us. The Costa Mesa police dispatched investigators to the scene. Inside of the car itself appeared to be clean. There was no blood there. There didn't appear to be any windows broken. There didn't appear to be any damage to the car. Her purse and shoes were gone, like she'd gotten out of her car and left. The flashers were on on the car, like she the car had broken down and she was going to get out and go walk for help. Search dogs picked up a scent on the side of the freeway, but soon lost it. Police then canvassed the neighborhoods near the highway. But no one had seen her. It appeared Denise Huber had simply vanished. worse than if I think I was afraid of for my own death because I was so afraid what happened to Denise she was so precious police used search helicopters and all other means to look for 23 year old Denise Huber after her abandoned car was found along a busy highway you could hear them from our house and you know what they're looking for and you you pray they don't find what they're looking for, because it's got to be obviously got to be a body that they're looking for. And uh, it's horrible. It's the most horrible feeling you could ever have. It's like I couldn't breathe for I don't know how long. Police examined the interior of Denise's car and found no foreign fingerprints. An analysis of the flat tire revealed it had not been tampered with. It just blew out from being underinflated, got too hot, and the sidewall failed. 
I just went flat. While the physical evidence led nowhere, police interviewed the last known person to see Denise, her date from the night before, Robert Calvert. Rob could have been infatuated with her and could have been upset because there was no uh, romantic contact between the two of them. Police also looked into Denise's relationship with Steve Horrocks, the boyfriend who was supposed to accompany Denise to the concert, but backed out at the last minute. Steve Horrocks was, again, cooperative. Any information we needed from him, he was always willing to give it. Police also tracked down Ross, the acquaintance Denise met at the El Cantina restaurant. Ross was able to put himself in the alibi situation um, to show that he did not go follow her after she dropped uh, Rob off. I never gave up hope that she'd be found alive. Uh, we did everything from thinking that she might have had a boyfriend that the folks didn't know about and maybe uh, left the state, left the city, uh, eloped. Desperate for leads, investigators and Denise's family turned to the media. All I knew is get a picture in front of people. Get the story out. And the news media, they were wonderful because every time we have anything going on, they would be there and they'd show it. So the community, really, it was like it was their daughter. We made buttons with Denise's picture that said, pray for Denise. We had bumper stickers that all of our police units carried and were available all over the community. There was a large banner that was placed along the 73 freeway here in Costa Mesa. The media attention produced hundreds of tips. Most were well-intentioned. Some were not. We'd hear from psychics. We'd hear from crackpots. We'd have, hear from people that would try and get money from us. 350 miles away in Prescott, Arizona, a man living in a well-to-do neighborhood called local police to report something suspicious in his neighbor's driveway. It was a rider truck with California license plates. It had an extension cord coming out of the back of the truck. The neighbor said it was plugged into an electrical socket on the side of the house. Whatever was inside the truck was running 24 hours a day. A search of the truck revealed it had been stolen in California. Inside, was an industrial-sized freezer in the cargo area. And inside the freezer was a large black garbage bag, uh, and, and they felt it and believed uh, what they felt was, a, was an arm of a, of a person. And I recall seeing uh, two arms coming back with the hands handcuffed and a ring. I remember seeing jewelry, and uh, I, was, I was really uh, shocked. And for the medical examiner, it would be the most difficult case she had ever encountered. For the past year, a stolen rider truck containing a freezer with a human body inside had been parked at the home of 39-year-old John Famolaro, a handyman and painter. Mr. Famolaro was very calm, he was very polite, um, and he just really didn't have much to say about it. Uh, but he seemed kind of indifferent to the whole thing. The contents of the freezer were sent to the Maricopa County Coroner's Office. Dr. Ann Buckholtz handled the case. Obviously, it's a homicide or at least a hidden body for some reason. And because if it's clandestine nature, you're like, okay, so we got an evidentiary thing here. Let's think homicide. Let's think the worst. And I said, yes, it's a female. She also had some female jewelry evident and long fingernails. The handcuffs were evident. And we didn't see much in the way of clothing. She appeared to be naked. Thawing the body would cause rapid decomposition. So Dr. Buckholtz needed to collect evidence quickly or lose it forever. I took a clean scalpel handle and actually scraped some of the watery fluid into jars and held it that way. I thought, well, at least we can collect the specimens. It was a sheer luck 
that we even got any sperm at all in a woman who's frozen three years. Dr. Buchholz removed the handcuffs and defrosted the hands slowly. When they're frozen, the skin is fairly symmetrical and intact until she starts losing the fluids and then the skin will start shriveling even in the fingertips. In fact, that's where it starts one of the first. We got all the prints that first day and they're actually rolled onto a fingerprint card just as if they were a person who's being arrested. It's the same process on a dead person. When they entered the prints into their computer database of missing persons, they immediately found a match. It was Denise Huber, who had been missing for three years. They were able to do the fingerprints, and that's something I never even thought of. I never imagined that we would have that kind of evidence after three years. Meanwhile, John Famolaro refused to explain why Denise's body was in his freezer, 350 miles away from where she disappeared. So police searched Famolaro's home and the home of his mother who lived next door. She was quite taken back that we uh, had also secured what we found to be her home. She knew nothing about John having girlfriends or who it might be and basically sat up a lawn chair across the street and just sat there and watched us for, for days. Police found the box marked Christmas on a shelf in Famolaro's garage. Inside was Denise's bloody clothing, her driver's license, and her high-heeled shoes. The shoes were scuffed and damaged as if she had been dragged across highway paving. And police found credit card receipts that showed Famolaro had bought the freezer just days after Denise's disappearance. They also discovered blood-stained clothing belonging to John Famolaro. They didn't know whose blood it was. They didn't know if it was Denise's, some other person's, a mixture, Mr. Famolaro's. So they needed a sample of Denise's blood. Well, we didn't have blood. So we ended up sending them some bone marrow. The DNA extracted from Denise Huber's bone marrow matched the DNA in the blood on Famolaro's clothes. In Famolaro's basement, police found a police officer's uniform and a dungeon. I think that all showed me he was just that type of person, not the mild-mannered person he was when I spoke to him. He had that very dark, violent other side, and uh, it was becoming more and more apparent as, as the case progressed on. One of his girlfriends that we talked to said that, yeah, he had some weird sexual fantasies. One of the girls had been uh, handcuffed um, and left exposed, uh, naked and handcuffed, left exposed to an open window. The evidence implicated Famolaro in the disappearance and death of Denise Huber, but it did not explain how she died. We took off two or three black plastic bags that had encased the whole body. And inside that were some smaller white plastic bags which covered the head. And when we removed that and we started defrosting her, we actually found a, a gag-type device over her face and over her mouth area. Uh, it was a piece of duct tape that had been taped over her upper mouth, nose area. Dr. Buckholz discovered that Denise's skull had been severely damaged. Dr. Laura Fulginetti, a forensic anthropologist, was asked to reconstruct the skull for further analysis. You look for parts that go together naturally, and you'd start with the vault or the top round part of the head, and then you proceed towards the face. And the reason I do it that way is because the face typically has the smallest, most complicated pieces. And you want to have your framework built so that when you get to the face, you have something to put the face back onto. The forensic analysis would reveal not only how Denise Huber died, but 
where. After a three-year search, Denise Huber's body was found in a freezer in Arizona. Forensic investigators reconstructed her skull in an effort to understand how she died. You can see patterned injuries of two different varieties indicating two different weapons were used and you can also see little pieces of plastic that are caught in those fractures. That told us that the bags were in place when she received the blows to the head. And Dr. Fulginetti discovered Denise had been hit 31 times. It's horrifying. And if I stop too long to think about what, how she felt when she was by the freeway, I'm paralyzed and I can't do my job. So I don't, I don't think about that until it's all over and done with. For me, it's a matter of, here's the puzzle. My job is to put the puzzle together and interpret the puzzle. And then I can go home and, and cry in the shower. <laughs> The semen found on Denise's clothing matched John Famolaro's DNA profile. She was innocent, an innocent victim. And it could have been anybody's sister. It could have been you, it could have been your sister, your friend, and, and that's scary. It really hurts you emotionally at that point when you realize that. I'll be honest, I won't drive on the interstate and, and allow anyone to help me because of this. Police also discovered that John Famolaro was working in Newport Beach, California at the time Denise disappeared. He had rented the front portion of this warehouse for his painting business. They talked to people who rented the unit after he had uh, moved out and abandoned it about what the unit, what condition the unit was in, and uh, they pointed us to this area in the corner where they found a a large brown stain that washed out with the hose and we thought well we know dried blood is very soft on water it, it can be washed away initial tests revealed nothing investigators decided to wait until dark and use luminol which fluoresces or glows when it comes into contact with the iron component in blood we sprayed it out of a little hand sprayer Eventually, we checked the whole warehouse. The only thing we ever found was just that blood in the corner of the warehouse. The DNA from those blood stains matched Denise Huber's DNA. And the nail gun found in the warehouse matched the indentations in Denise's skull. Based on the forensic evidence, prosecutors believe that when Denise's tire went flat, Famolaro stopped and offered to help. At some point, he overpowered her and took her to his warehouse a few miles away. There, he killed her. He stored the body in a freezer he bought a few days after he killed Denise. Two years later, he stole the rider truck and took the freezer with Denise's body in it with him when he moved to Arizona. He kept the truck in his driveway with the freezer running constantly. He's kind of a sick guy, that's his, that's his thing. John has uh, been violent to other people and it's, it's escalated up to the point of murder, but uh, I don't think Denise has been the only one. On June 20th, 1997, six years after Denise disappeared, John Famolaro was tried and convicted of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death. Forensics were... It was challenged every step of the way here in court, even before court. I think a lot of it went to the state Supreme Court. But every challenge was beat back because of great forensics and great police work. I wanted to know the truth, and some of it was horrible. But I'd rather have the answers than just be wondering in my mind. Because sometimes you imagine things as bad or worse than what they were. This really is the way it's supposed to be done, and then it makes you work harder on the next one. And when you're about to throw your hands up in despair, you think, Denise Huber. 
You did that case. You got it reconstructed. Keep at it. There is an answer here.